So hi everybody and welcome to number three of our interviews with the experts and today we have the amazing Lee Mates who's an occupational therapist from Australia. She's a paediatric OT so we'll be talking a little bit about child development and what we as parents can do to support the developmental needs. So hi, hello Lee. Hi. <laughs> so Lee's all the way from Australia so it's taken us a little while to um, get this together properly for you. And to make sure that we're both in the right kind of spaces and, and time and everything. So we're finally here. And after a couple of mishaps, we've got it. So, yes, I'd just like to welcome you in, Lee. And thank you so much for coming in to do this um, interview with the Expert Series. It's so brilliant that you're here. So I'll hand it over to you now for a little bit. And if you could just explain what occupational therapy is and also what paediatric occupational therapy is. So kind of your role within that. Okay, well, firstly, thanks for asking me to come in because um, any opportunity I get to talk about the things that we do, I'm going to take it. So thanks for having me in and asking me to come in and share this information. Um, so OT um, is all about helping people to do the things that they need to do, want to do and have to do. So um, it's about function and meaningful activity and making sure that we just live the most extraordinary lives that we could possibly live despite disability or, um, you know, injury or mental health or whatever it might be. So um, OT is all about um, living our best life, I guess. Um, and in, the, in regards to paediatrics, it's all to do with um, the things that kids need to do, have to do and want to do. So things like um, going to school and performing academically, <clears throat> play skills, social skills, um, independent skills like eating, sleeping, I guess it's not independent, but toileting, um, dressing, all the things that you need to develop to be um, an independent, functional um child so that's um kind of what ot is an ot with kids um, my role mostly i'm working um with majority of children are around the age of two and a half to say nine i do see kids all the way up to almost adulthood but that's the biggest case so that i would see the majority have autism um, or you know somewhere on the autism spectrum disorder and um, sensory processing difficulties which I'll touch on what sensory processing is um, learning and um, developmental delay so just lots of kids who are just behind with their talking and walking and um, movement patterns and um, just just following a typical developmental pattern but just delayed so we're working on filling in those gaps so <laughs> that's probably the most um, the biggest referral um, kind of base that I get and um, then just some you know handwriting school based things where um, quite you know mild I guess kind of a referral but the majority of the kids I work with would be on the autism spectrum for sure. So um, could you, would you have to talk me through like a sort of typical day of what you would do I don't know if there is such a thing as a typical day actually because being an occupational <laughs> therapist myself it was it was so different every single day you know you never know who you're going to meet sometimes and, and what kind of situation is yeah. going to be presented with you and also what the family dynamics are going to be and where they're going to be emotionally have they slept have they eaten you know it's all these um holistic factors that get taken into whenever you go and see someone so i know it can vary wildly but would you be able to just sort of talk us through how you would be within that kind of situation and what what would happen and yeah, for sure. So, um, like you said, sometimes factors like um, sleep or whether they've eaten or whether, um, and particularly with kids on the spectrum, whether something may just happen that week or something out of routine or um, there's been a transition or mums come to therapy instead of dad or the vice versa or grandparents pick them up. So sometimes it can be any little thing that can throw the situation out. So I guess the way I view it with OT is um, we definitely have therapy goals. So when they come into therapy, um, we've got our big sensory gym set up with our swings and crash mats and all the fun things and we definitely want to on in an ideal situation get in and start working on like I talked about those developmental gaps um, but there are days when kids come in and they're really upset and dysregulated or um, tired or they're just have you know some behaviors have popped up or you know it's just been a really hard week and in uh, that's probably a session where it's even more important that we can use um, our skills to look at how we can manage those um, 
behaviors or um, the emotion or help sort of you know calm the nervous system because that's the real world for these kids it's not an ideal day every day so we do want to work on um, therapy goals and it'd be great to get stuck in but there are definitely days when we are um, looking at you know trying to calm calm kids down and um, reset the nervous system and get some um, get them in that optimal kind of zone to be then working on the therapy goals is that is yeah. that okay yeah yeah definitely and um, so do you kind of predominantly work with children with learning difficulties then uh so mostly or like autism and then this not so much i mean you don't work with autism you work with the associated challenges <laughs> uh, the majority of the things i'm working on would be around em emotion regulation and behavior i think that and you would know this that in the ot world um not many people really know what it is we do so um quite often by the time families have made it to me they're usually at their wits end and they're willing to try anything and they don't know a lot about what ot is but they've been told this is you know i'm going to help so um i do find that um behaviors are usually at a pretty all-time high and they're really desperate and they're just really keen to come in and and try this thing called ot so um, most of the things i'm working around would be around emotion behavior um but then things like um play skills would definitely roll in there a lot so just kind of catching up development and motor skills so i mean traditionally they're called basket weavers for, you know for working on fine motor so <laughs> and we always um, wear red shoes that. apparently that's the other thing that everyone says that ot's wear red shoes and i've got to say the only pair of red shoes that i own are sparkly dorothy from wizard of Oz high heels which are definitely not what i would have worn for my work so yeah i, I think that is totally not true uh, Look, I probably would at some point wear sparkly red shoes because I work with kids, but I wouldn't in the adult wards. So, um, <laughs> yeah, it's quite yeah, so, yeah, so I mean, we're working with all these things. Like I mentioned, some kids just come to me for handwriting or, yeah, maybe not reading so well or um, there are definitely those referrals, but most of the kids I'm working with, um, you know, they might not be talking, they might, they're not engaging, not interacting they're not toilet trained. You know, there's all these other things that kids would come, but I would say that my, like the things that most parents would say would be the behavior and emotion would be right. the hardest. That's such a big one, isn't it? Because then that's going to affect the emotions of the parent as well. And um, yeah. you know, that's something that, that I work with a lot as well. It's actually how, what sort of coping mechanisms and strategies we can use as parents when we're faced with and dealing with um high emotions within uh, specifically within toddlers as well because uh, you know toddler toddlerdom is is when you go through that sort of developmental stage is so full-on for these little people and they're dealing with so much already they, they mm -hmm. don't know how to express themselves they don't know how to kind of tell you what's going on properly and as as grown human adults that's you know we're, we're now conditioned to think a certain way and it's like you know obviously we forget what's really going through their mind and how to kind of tap into that so it's really really interesting and i know that there's going to be a lot of people listening to this who are um there's good there are some key stages definitely the there's a few pregnant people who I know who are, who are in the group and who will be listening to this. There's quite a lot of um, women who have had their babies within the last few months, sort of within that sort of first year. <clears throat> And then we've got um, the sort of stages of there's quite a lot of toddler tantrums. I'm speaking to a lot of women at the moment <laughs> who are hit in that three year old stage and that two and three year old stage where it's really quite it's really, really quite intense. Um, <clears throat> and then again, sort of a, a little bit older where they're sort of going to school. And <clears throat> I know for boys, their testosterone levels are around the same, if not a bit more that they get when they're a teenager. So these tiny little humans are like <laughs> influxed with this phenomenal amount of testosterone. And like, how do you deal with that? You know, it's so no wonder like a lot of us with little boys are going, what's happening? You know, it's, it's, it's really quite intense. But um, so maybe we could talk a little bit around that, if that would be okay. Maybe we could talk about what our, us as parents could do in terms of supporting the developmental needs of those sort of key stages um sort of starting from pregnancy i guess and what we can do as mums and as parents um to facilitate that and to help that grow as well as nurturing our sort of emotional well-being as well so what do you think around that what is there anything that we can sort of talk around yeah. the pregnancy stage yeah, so i think um and correct me if i have an interpret you know where you're leading with this but um i guess if um you want, you know, in that terms of nurturing 
you know, young, you know, young kids with tantrums and trying to guide that. And they've got, like you said, all this stuff going on. And I think to try and look at the first thing to look at is just to kind of um, not view behavior or tantrums or meltdowns yeah. as, um, first of all, a personal attack on you, because it's so easy when we're all heightened and all stressed to think that, um, you know, it's so when you're when you're heightened, it's really easy to take that as a personal attack and to view. And when, you're um, but second, too, when you're exhausted as well. <laughs> yeah, when you're tired. Um, and the other thing is that kids don't really have a behavioural issue. They don't really, um, it's not a behaviour that the issue is. It's usually underlining. And you actually mentioned quite a few of those underlying things. One can be, and we're talking, you know, typically developing children um, and some of the reasons why they would have um, behavioural um, kind of episodes or tantrums or meltdowns is um, firstly not being able to get their message across. So, um, you know, being able to express exactly what they want to tell you. Um, but secondly, they are um, so curious. They've got mo their mobile by a toddler t um, stages. So exploring their world, they're just getting so much information from their um, environment through the sensory channels. Um, so they're taking on so much filtering out in the brain and then having to um you know have a response to all this sensory input so they're learning at a really rapid um, pace they're exploring they're curious they're excited um you know it's a stage where they're trying to learn about their own body and who they are and then who they are in relation to everybody else and everything in their world so there's so much going on so i think if you can kind of view um you know that you know how you said a minute ago about being tired when you're really tired and exhausted and you have no capacity to kind of manage anything extra it's very similar for kids so fatigue goes in there but they are just this they get over overwhelmed because there's so much to process when you're in that growing um phase and when you're in that exploratory kind of really cur curious kind of stage does that make sense yeah definitely so what do you think that we could is so is there any kind of activity that we could do to enable that kind of inner calm uh, perhaps or just to just to kind of promote and reinforce their development really and to support their yeah. development needs at that time so maybe if we could go through a few kind of you know an activity for someone who's um a woman who's who's pregnant and then a, an activity for um within that first year of, of birth and then um an activity for toddler and then an activity for a sort of school age as well so, um i guess um during pregnancy i mean and you would know probably even more about you know the pregnancy times than i would but um uh, there's i think and we think about trauma and not trauma in terms of, or not necessarily in terms of abuse or um sorry my back just gone off. Is, okay. there yeah, yeah. sorry yeah. um but you know trauma in terms of um you know lots of stress and some of this trauma can be from stress during pregnancy and this is not a blame game or a, you know look out mums who are stressed like it's more of a you know being mindful of that stress while you are pregnant and really starting to um you know think about your own um stress management tools because when you uh when we have little kids they literally look at what you do in any situation yeah. and copy it and you know that when you have a kid who starts swearing or a kid who starts, you know, <laughs> yeah, doing I found that one out. <laughs> I don't know. That was from the dad. That was, uh, that's not for me. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think that if you can just start looking at that now, like thinking, you know, what do you want to model? Um, but secondly, I don't know anybody in my friendship group who hasn't got their own um, emotion things going on. Mm -hmm. And if you, Start to kind of think about those things and manage those things now um you know just exploring them and working out what kind of triggers you and you know what you need for yourself in terms of that self-care to kind of um keep yourself in that calm space because the very best thing you can do for a child who's who's emotional and having emotional things is to be able to hold that space for them so when we talk about holding space we talk about being there and allowing the emotion and validating the emotion and riding through that emotion with the child. So I, I think our intuition is to shut down. Don't cry. It's okay. Stop crying. Everything's all good, but you're okay. It's not a big deal. And we kind of, um, we're doing that because we want them to stop crying firstly, because it's noisy, but secondly, because we don't want to be sad. We don't want to see them being sad and distressed, but, um, 
we really need to be able to, if possible, hold that space and allow them to move through that emotion. Yeah, um, to do that, it's a lot of self-reflection to, uh, before, perhaps before you yeah, even come into that situation. Yeah. And this is not a judging thing or a bad mum thing or anything. I, like I said, there's not one person in my friendship group who I can think of off the top of my head. I'm sure there is, you know, someone incredible with all this innate, um, you know, mindful way. But the majority of the people I know will all tell you they've got their things that trigger them and their hang-ups from their own childhood. Or um, There's so many things that influence our own emotion. So if I can just, yeah, for, for a pregnant woman, I'd be thinking about... Um, you know, what things do trigger me? What do I need to be able to be calm? If, you know, do I need just when, you know, do I have a point where I just need to take a break and come back? So what do I want to model? And I think, um, and yeah, just not, not beating yourself up about all these things because the more you do that, the more stressed you become and it just keeps on flowing. I and when you think... Really, really it, good information to have that kind of non-judgmental awareness of, of self and to appreciate that as well and to a- allow yourself to to be honest with your own with your own self and be vulnerable and and, and accept that and yeah sort of cherish that yeah mm. yeah this is absolutely not a be perfect all the time thing this is just what I I guess yeah. to kind of prepare yourself because there are times when they don't stop crying mm. or when you have a hysterical and it's high-pitched and it's really getting to your ears and there's yeah. and you just need to try they come so if you can kind of look at that in that pregnancy time or pre-pregnancy if you're kind of in that planning phase and really work out how you can maintain calm yourself mm. because when you have a baby and kind of moving now into that um newborn time mm. um you don't have a lot of sleep <clears throat> so like you said before and so you are really pushed to your capacity when it comes to managing your own emotions as well as a baby's um so when you uh, thinking about a baby they don't have the ability to express themselves other than to cry and you also don't have the ability to tell them it's you know cut, let's calm down let's have a hug um, take some deep breaths like all the things that we know calm the nervous mm-hmm. system and so you can't tell a baby that and the only way you can really purvey that to a baby is through your own tone and the way you talk and the way you move and um, how you hold them and how you speak to them. And so it's almost like that entrainment kind of thing. So your tone and your calm is what's going to help calm the baby. So I guess that's kind of how that rolls into there. And I would just be um, yeah, really mindful of holding that space, even though they don't understand words or have, they can't take on an action like take deep breath they can definitely feel and hear your tone and know your calm. And we talk about kids pick up on our anxiety. It's not made up. That's a real thing. So um, I think, yeah, really trying to maintain that. Does yeah. that kind of... Yeah, no, yeah. definitely. And I think I think as well, um, yeah, I mean, also don't beat yourself up if you do lose it or, or if you can't handle it one day. Because do you know what? Like, as the saying goes, and I will say it on here, no one has their shit together like <laughs> no, no one has their shit together you know we do some days and sometimes maybe some people would have it more together than others but underneath it all everyone has their own things that they're dealing with um so that's really yeah that's a really nice way to kind of like almost like a segue from the pregnancy self-awareness holding that space for yourself learning how to self-care and self-soothe and self-love and really hold on to that to then explore that with your child sort of within that those early developmental stages because they do they do pick up on stuff um so then how, how what would you say sort of if you were presented with someone um within that sort of toddler toddler age range from like sort of two one to three kind of kind of space um what could we do then as parents to support their behavior and emotional well-being what kind of activities could we do with them so what could someone do today after they've just listened to this with their toddler yeah, I think um, one of the things that I really love doing with young kids and families is, um, and I do it in my job, but also just in general with my own kids or with friends, is um, try and find a space in your home where you can create um, like a little quiet area um, where it's, you know, screen free, um, you know, quick and it can, you can have a tent, a cardboard box, you can build a cubby together, but just a place where... Um, it's not a timeout. It's not a getting sent to the quiet space when you're naughty or whatever. It's more about, um, you know, you might've had a busy morning at the park or you can just see that they're very tired and you can see, you can, you know, attention's probably going to come really soon or you can start to read those signs and take a break. Like this whole skill of learning to take a break follows us through to adulthood. Like 
that's something that I think I didn't learn until I was like 30. So I'm like, you know, I, I'd love to have been taught that skill when I was little. And so we, we use this phrase quite a bit with the kids we work with, but just in general is I can see that, you know, think we're really busy or you look a little bit tired or, you know, kind of reflecting on what you feel is going on and saying, why don't we go take a break in our quiet space or um, let's go read a book in the quiet space and really start to um, label kind of the solution of I can yeah. see you feeling or I can see we've had, a, oh, we've had such a big morning. Let's take a break in our quiet space. And, you, oh, you know, that. yeah, it's such a beautiful thing to do. And, you know, sometimes you know, I said earlier that sometimes when kids come in, you know, I've got all these therapy ideas and we don't really get to them because we're really focusing on regulation. One of the things that we do when kids come in and they're really out of sync is, <clears throat> excuse me, um, we build a cubby and we, you know, we do some respiration if, if they're, you know, developmentally able to do that. Um, so I love the idea of a quiet space and it's just, you know, cushions and it's, they can go in there by themselves or with their mom um, or dad, you know, carer. Um, it's nice to have just, um, things that are soft and some books and things that are kind of, you know, down-regulated. It's calming, isn't it, for their energy? And because as well, they don't know at that stage how to sort of, I mean, I see this a lot with my my boy and he's just turned three and, you know, we can really see the signs now when he's getting very exhausted and when he's becoming really, really tired and um, we can read yeah. and preempt that and we know whether he's going to be a bit hungry or a bit thirsty and actually <clears throat> what we tend to do it's really similar to what you've just been saying um is we don't actually have a television in our house anyway we use like netflix on laptops and stuff like that sometimes but um yeah it's to actually just go and create a den or uh, get his puzzles out because he really likes doing puzzles or his his picture books which is all about tractors because he's obsessed with tractors so it's just about i guess like so what you're saying there it just feels really it feels really nourishing actually for both parent and yeah. child to experience in that sort of co-occupation together where they're sharing in that down space where they're sharing in that sort of play space almost getting down onto their level i guess isn't it and yeah. and it's yeah. um i mean you can if they're older or if they can you know if you if they're willing and they want to have a go you can like you know use lots of little respiratory tools like um you know i wouldn't use whistles that make a noise but you can get different <laughs> like you know whistles that you blow out and they don't make a noise they might have like little cars spin or a little um you know kazoos are funny when you've got a little sort of you know older um toddler you kind of talk do funny talking in kazoos to yeah. trying to get because the long the longer we can exhale for the better the inhale and when we breathe the exhale is what actually activates the parasympathetic part of the nervous system which is that calming bit um, and we just need really good deep breath. So um, respiratory toys are great to have in there, but you don't have to have all these things. Like I said before, if you can use your own tone and hold that space. Um, but, you know, I like the idea of hideouts to try and beat the tantrum, like to try and calm back down because you know yourself when you've had a busy day, you get home and you don't even want to hear the TV or the radio yeah, or somebody make a noise, yeah. dog bark, or mm. just you want just a little bit of peace and quiet. And then you can usually come back and, you know, get the rest of the day. So. I think um, learning from a really young young age to take a break is really um, key skill. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that's really wonderful for toddlers when they, are, or for everybody as we grow older as well, is um, doing something with the hands, even if it's just making like, you know, a spaghetti necklace or um, doing, you know, some Play-Doh and just using the hands because we draw our attention and the eyes just to the here and now. And again, it's a really nice, um, strategy to learn from a young age like to do something with their hands and to be crafty and to you know that is I guess it's kind of mindfulness for kids mindfulness for kids absolutely it really is so um I think crafts are a fantastic thing to do with um with so that could then do you think that would then sort of go on to the slightly older kids so if you've got kind of like school age children um you know it's a sort of craft work something that you would then bring in yeah. as absolutely well, I guess, yeah, yeah so, um, I didn't mention earlier because I kind of had in my head, I guess, the developmental stuff that I do. But um, one of the referral base that we <clears throat> get quite a lot of is um, particularly young girls, but young kids, you know, that age nine and up um, with anxiety. And we're seeing it more and more. Unfortunately, it, just, it definitely is something that's on the rise in, in our um, busy, fast paced lives that we lead now. Um, and one of the things that we do is quite a lot of um, we do, some, you know, lots of self-awareness, goal setting and different things. But um, we really encourage um, um, the, the art and um, we're actually in the pro I, I had some students from the university come through this year and we put together um, it's not 
a plan that's been put into action yet, but it, there's a full literature review was done, a full plan on um, a week to week workshops um, group, sorry, that had all these workshops to do with um, creative arts and the use of creative, creative arts and um, kind of layering in um, women from our community to facilitate this. So there's people here who do pottery and macrame, um, you know, photography, um, there's a beautiful woman um, locally who does like basket weaving, um, traditional kind of Aboriginal um, weaving. So there's so many things that we um, have, you know, talked about. There's sewing. So trying to like each week to um, use that. And that's a group that we've actually um, put together an actual program for that we're hoping to run in 2020. Oh, gorgeous. So that's really kind of <laughs> the social aspect. <laughs> <you know. laughs> no, no, it's great. that's what it's all about. It's about just exploring you know, where, where, where this all sort of comes into it. And I think when we do sometimes go a little bit off track to, to things, that's when you really discover these gorgeous little nuggets of joy. And I think what you said there as well with that group programme, I think for sort of slightly older kids, it really does, especially if someone's perhaps having difficulty fitting in or, or having a bit of trouble with kind of socialising or something like that, or just generally feeling uh, quite emotional up, up and down is that safe yeah. space where they can be in that because when you're sharing within that same activity every, you're on the same place aren't you so everyone's doing the same thing so instead of you being being like an outsider or anything like that you're all in there and you're all doing this one activity because you either want to or you want to be in that space and it yeah, yeah i think that's really a nice way to kind of yeah control that all all aspects of holistic well-being as well yeah I also think and I don't know about you but if you've ever gone to a group where it's you know something you've gone and done a macrame thing or whatever but um when you first get there everyone's really nervous no one wants to talk no one wants to introduce themselves like you know that kind of social anxiety that almost everyone would get like I think even you know the boldest and confident of people would still come into a room and you need to feel your place and the vibe so um but when you start to work with their hands and you're working on a project side by side the chatter kind of just flows and then, you know, it develops. It's awkward at first, but then, yeah, if you have that kind of project, I do think that that is something that kind of generates just, um, yeah, it just connection. And um, one of the things that we talk about when, when kids or anybody's not calm is um, to create calmness, but also create connection because that is what we really are craving is connection. And so um, just the whole sorry just to interrupt you really quickly just uh, on the on the connection side of things just really importantly because the whole world is over overridden with internet now and game online gaming and things like that and you know so many children are involved in that um so yeah to have that kind of human connection again is just yeah absolutely brilliant um so let's just overgo over go let's just go over those those sort of key things so with pregnancy um, then you sort of talked about the self-reflection and, and being aware of your own self and your own emotional needs and your own capacity and things like that, maybe even writing it down, holding that space for yourself. And then within that sort of first year, again, holding that kind of space to facilitate that for the child so they can pick up on your energy so they can feel your words and what you're, you know, hear you, although they don't understand necessarily what the words mean, but they'll be able to pick up on that through the tone. And then going through into sort of the toddler space where, where we are more connected with our child by that point and we understand their rhythms and their their sort of routines and look out for signs so we can really facilitate that with calm nurturing gentle space at home so it's really easy to access it can be involved with all the family it's not a you and them it's everybody together so again bringing in that connection and then sort of going on to all the children where we're sort of exploring allowing them to um not allowing but like facilitating alternative spaces for them to explore their own selves within those mm -hmm. shared occupations together and those activities that they're doing with other children mm -hmm. and other kids of their similar age that mm -hmm. again, you're getting that human connection you're getting that social environment you're getting a, a, a chance to actually explore your vulnerability and and then um, kind of support the brain as it's developing through those stages would that be about right would you say yeah absolutely and that's just kind of i guess one element of it mm -hmm. um but the other thing, and, you know, I just think this, and this is something that's followed me, probably was a saving grace for me as a kid because I was a pretty, um, not highly strong, just intense, on the go, uh, you know, I guess I probably would have had ADHD in this day and age. You probably do have ADHD. It, like that kind of intensity, and I would get overloaded and I did have meltdowns and I was just constantly thinking and just, you know, 
all on the go all the time. And the thing that was my saving grace and still is now, and I, I said yesterday in a little post when you asked about self-care, I saw I was off hiking, but is nature time and nature from day one. So just having that connection with the earth because um, nature is full of sounds that um, give us a really, that kind of give us sounds and sharpness that we don't get in other um, locations. And that gives you a really good grounding perception of who you are and where you are. So the sounds that we get from nature, um, obviously just the calmness that nature provides, it's, there's a science behind it. It's like not, you know, woo woo, but it's, um, you know, there's this, I think that, um, can, you know, can, can, connecting with the textures of nature, you know, with the hands you can create, you can just be, um, that mindfulness of focusing on, you know, the things you can hear and see and touch. And these are things you can be doing with your toddler, you know, from a really young age. Is <clears throat> even just, you know, they may not understand the concept of, oh, let's listen, you know, let's listen to five things you can hear, but you could definitely go, oh, did you hear the bird? Or, oh, wow, this leaf is really crunchy. Or, you know, you, you can just grade that, but spending time in nature and um, I, and I guess, um, there is a time and place for screens in this day and age. Without a doubt, we are using screens. I guess it's part of it all. And there's definitely some benefits, but screens are not um, ever going to replace human connection or nature connection. They're not a great option um, for hours of the day. And um, like I said, it's no judging and whatever else. Like we've all been, you know, prone to the screen babysitter and that's, you know, it happens. So it's yeah. just sometimes. <laughs> so like, uh, yeah. this is not about the judging the whole bad mom thing but if we can just um just provide as much time as possible in nature um from day one i think that we just end up with you know it's a really good option for kids and it carries them through to adulthood as well that's lovely that's a really nice thing to end with actually because i think for most people we can access nature as well even if it's just your back garden for like i don't know 10 minutes definitely yeah. just to sit, sit in a yeah. yeah oh yeah. Lee, it's been absolutely amazing to speak to you thank you so much for coming on and chatting with me today and i think i really think our listeners are going to get so much benefit from what you've talked about and how you've explained everything so thank you so much and i really really hope that you'll come back at some point soon and we can dive into other other aspects of development <laughs> i hope so because i feel like there's so many more things i could there's suggest so so I'm like, hey, why are we, where are we going <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'll tell you, I'm actually going to go to bed because it's like, I don't know, I'll pretend here, I think. So I know where I'm going, but I can just keep on chatting. It's so nice. It's yeah. um, like well, a it's the platform. I take it and run with it because um, I really want to share this stuff. We we are living in a in a very different world to even when, you know, we were kids. Um, it's fast paced and we're, we are all over scheduled ourselves, our kids. And some of that's unavoidable and some of that's just because their friends are doing it too and they all want to do the same sports and whatever. And we are just so busy all of the time. Um, so if I get a chance to talk about these things that can kind of counteract that or balance that out, mm. I'm going to do it. Thank you for giving me that platform. And if you do so happen welcome. to, if you do happen to come on and listen, whoever is jumping on, I hope you make it to the end and you, um, you have any questions, you can um, definitely track me down in the, um, in the collective in um, Naomi's beautiful group. So um, yeah, definitely don't be a stranger if there's anything further you want to kind of um, start a conversation about. I, um, I'm in there. If you tag me, um, I can help you out with that. So how else would they be able to find you as well? So they can find you within the Connected Mother Collective if they tag um, at Lee Mates. So you can find you in there, but also um, have you got a website? Have you got another page that they can go and find you on as well? Yeah. So um, I have a Facebook page. I have an Instagram account and a Facebook page. I'm probably more active on Facebook. So it would be the best place to probably, you know, if you want to check in and start a discussion or if you want to private message me, I'm probably going to get it better in there. Um, so it's just Lee Mates um, Occupational Therapy. And I actually have a little group attached to that as well. I'm definitely not as amazing as Naomi with it yet and um, as interactive, but I do have plans for 2020. And that's it's, it's attached to my um, Facebook page um, and it's called the Anchored Kids Network. Um, so if you want to jump in there, I'd love to have you in there. But yeah, any even like I said, if you just tag me in something on Naomi's page, but um, yeah, I just want to share this message. So if anyone wants to get in touch or follow up or ask a question or be more specific then, I'll put some um, details please. within the post as well so people can actually just click and get straight to you so Fabulous. yeah you should just share all little bits and pieces like um you know not every day but I try to you know post regularly just um my tips and ideas and um my perspectives on things and just different articles or things I find interesting so yeah definitely come and join me in any of those spaces it would be fantastic Amazing.
Oh, well, we'll really yeah. look forward to seeing you soon then. <laughs> Take care, Thanks. Thanks. Lovely. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on. I, I'm not sure how to actually turn it off. Like, you I'm tech savvy people are so cool. Oh, I, I just, <laughs> I'm just going to leave. <laughs> I'm just leaving. Bye for now. <laughs>